First of all, thank you um, for inviting me. Uh, my name is Giovanni Carotenuto. I am a, a, a lawyer. Uh, I run my own firm. And uh, I am the president of uh, the board of Pro Bono Italia. Uh, is, Pro Bono Italia is an association of uh, lawyers, law firms, and forensic association launched in May of this year. The seeds of, uh, for Pro Bono Italia were planted uh, almost four years ago when uh, we started with the uh, Italian Pro Bono Roundtables, uh, leading to um, the uh, Forum of 2015 in Rome. So far, we held uh, 21 roundtables. We are having the next one in uh, November. And uh, a, a, a result which, is, which must be uh, highlighted is that the next one will be held at the court of Milan uh, in the biggest conference room they have available. Uh, and this is something which, uh, again, is by itself an, an, an achievement because we uh, managed to talk to the um, president of the, of, the co of the Court of Milan, of the Bar Council of Milan, and uh, uh, get his attention uh, and all the Bar Council attention on the pro bono matters. By the way, it's, it's working now? No? Uh, okay, sorry, sorry to interrupt. The, um, we think, I, I wanted to start from this because um, the sensitivity about pro bono uh, in Italy um, is not, I, I would say, the same of any UK, uh, Anglo-Saxon country. Even though we are um, a Latin country, so pro bono publico uh, is actually the root of our language as well, uh, however, uh, we have, pro bono is not institutionalized in Italy. So we thought that uh, pro bono Italia could be a good occasion to promote and spread a pro bono culture in our country, but starting from the bar councils. And so the dialogue with the other lawyers, law firms, and when I say law firms, I, I, I mean uh, uh, small, medium-sized, and uh, big law firms, global firms, uh, but also with the local bar councils is absolutely crucial. Uh, I mentioned the round tables. Uh, each round table uh, is structured in a way uh, we introduce first NGOs, new NGOs, um, then we discuss upon new ongoing, new or ongoing projects, and then we have a final uh, um, session of uh, uh, Q&A or open uh, to any kind of, uh, in, of proposal of a new initiatives. Uh, the um, uh, um, path uh, leading to the uh, establishment of Pro Bono Italia was actually long and not easy because uh, we also had to uh, understand the, f the right formula uh, for the association. The, the reason is that uh, the movement of pro bono, the, w the one I'm speaking about today, uh, started uh, on, by the support of PILNET. So in 2014, we had the chance to, uh, um, almost all the people who were um, um, uh, involved in pro bono, to uh, get together and speak about how we could be effective in promoting pro bono in Italy. And so the round table were a great tool, and we are keeping this tool uh, also on a, on a for, or going forward basis. However, the need to establish Pro Bono Italia was, as I said, to uh, in establish a, a dialogue with the, the institutions, also to uh, um, get the sensitivity of uh, uh, the ordinary people about some important uh, themes. Uh, one of them is migration. We are uh, now uh, also um, uh, organizing a, an event, uh, hopefully for next year, on, on this argument. And um, I believe that uh, the, it's important to get the attention uh, not only of our world, but also on uh, social, economic, uh, and I would say, generally speaking, political 
meaning of this phenomenon. Um, uh, we, um, I don't, ah, okay, I can say next. Well, I, I, I actually already covered this, but we, we can actually, you can, you can please go back uh, just to mention that uh, the, the members of Propon Italia, as you can see, are the, of course the global law firms, most of them, but you can see from this picture, slide, that we also have uh, medium-sized firms, some, so, some solo practitioners, and this is important because our goal is also to involve uh, lawyers and law firms from all over, all over Italy. One of the points uh, Dima made in, uh, on, in presenting to the, to the speakers uh, this uh, session was why do you think your initiative can be good to the population and which kind of people you can get involved? Uh, I believe that nowadays uh, in Italy, particularly after almost 10 years of recession, our target is also ordinary people. So we are not only talking about people in, in real necessity, but um, the, trash, the legal aid uh, institute we have is a constitutional right, only covers uh, court uh, uh, fee expenses and fees, and the threshold is actually very uh, low, uh, uh, is 11,500 euro uh, revenue, annual revenue, uh, gross for the entire family. So you can imagine that there is a big gray area which is not covered by the legal aid. And we think, and we have, a, we have experienced so far, that uh, there is room for uh, pro bono help, uh, help from, from lawyers. You can go on because I would like just to, to continue by saying, this is a, 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 no, no, please, that one, please. Uh, one before, this one. Um, this is the net network we have, so you can see that, and I'm talking about the Italian pro bono round table, we have 300 plus participants, 60% law firms, uh, the rest is uh, NGOs, uh, lar large companies, just a few of them, uh, legal clinics, and uh, the two cleaning houses. The point is here to get to try to involve uh, the civil society, and uh, I just would like to spend one um, uh, word more about the legal clinics, which is a movement in Italy. We, we've just signed two agreements with uh, Roma 3 and Perugia University for, uh, to uh, get the help from them, uh, and uh, uh, the next roundtable in Milan will uh, dedicate a big part uh, to legal clinics, just to, to uh, uh, get the attention of uh, uh, students, not only of uh, professionals, those students, of course, monitored and, uh, and supported uh, by, by professors or lawyers within the university. Next one. Uh, those are the two clearing houses. Uh, CHILD is a coalition of 35 associations uh, particularly dedicated to uh, the, um, uh, the civil liberties and, uh, and uh, human rights defenses. They are part of uh, PILNET uh, network as well. And the other one is CSVNET, is the national coordination of, of the volunteer services, uh, service centers. Uh, they have almost like, uh, almost 10,000 centers spread all around the country. So. Uh, it happened uh, uh, through a good intuition of PILNET to involve those two, um, let's say, organization, and uh, in the course of the time, we succeeded in uh, establishing those two clearing houses. Uh, next one, please. You can see from this slide that uh, uh, we have an increasing number of requests uh, spread through the 300 plus uh, people uh, mailing list, and. Uh, we started the first year in 2015, I, I think we had something like 18 requests. Now, only this year, we are, and we are in October, I think we have 58 requests. So you can see that there is a, an increasing number. Totally speaking, are, we had something like 150 requests successfully um, dealt with. Uh, and uh, also I would like to thank, there are many law firms uh, in, this, in this room today, uh, most of, of which are they have uh, offices in Italy. Thank you very much because any request, as far as I know, is uh, taken in a, in a matter of minutes, not, not even days, minutes. So we are very happy for this. Um, so just to finish off, uh, we literally are working around the clock in order to, and to be perfectly honest, I also 
like to, to say something, uh, something like a personal note. I, it happened that a couple of years ago I started my own firm. So in other words, <laughs> I'm just doing something like two startups at the same time, and uh, perhaps this helped because I don't have to, you know, to um, uh, set my clock about billable hours stuff. I can devote my time a little bit more free than before, even though I have many, many organizational uh, things to look after. Uh, and this is a personal note, but all the people we, ha we are on, we have on the board and helping us, I have to say, are exceptional individuals. So. Our uh, aim here is to get even more people, more professionals involved. So if you have uh, offices in Italy and you think that uh, your uh, peers there, your folks there can be of help, please uh, you know, get in touch and, uh, and uh, I'm sure that we could uh, build on this. Thanks. Thank you, Giovanni. Uh, we will change the... You have Kazakhstan, please? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Trying to make the clicker work, among other things. So, Tatiana, please start. I yeah. to do something else so that you can use the clicker maybe yeah. if you could just make a start. Why don't you start? Get it up and running in two seconds. And if you can please step on the slides uh, in, they will in, mode in a minute mode so that yeah. they, they change will. automatically. Yeah. Um, my name is Tatiana Chernobyl. I am from Kazakhstan. And I am on the other end of the equation, so to speak, um, at the recipient end. I'm a consultant for Amnesty International. For Central Asia, um, I'm a member of the Coalition of NGOs Against Torture, and um, I, I'm also a participant of the NPM in, in Kazakhstan, and mostly work on torture cases, torture-involved cases. And we have some experience at the NGO of referring our cases to lawyers, to criminal lawyers. Uh, we don't have a pro bono in Kazakhstan, but it's questionable, yeah? What do you, what you call a pro bono? Uh, of course, we have people willing to work voluntarily, to volunteer their time, professionals, legal professionals who work on cases. Um, they don't uh, advertise. If you can just put it on an open mic, I'm not going to try to. Um, they usually don't go public about that. They think that it's their moral obligation that they owe, owe to the society, that they owe to the public. And while you see the slides, I want to uh, tell you rather about the topic of our discussion today, uh, global pro bono, uh, planted or taken root locally. Uh, we have an example of uh, when I was still working at the Open Society Justice Initiative in Kazakhstan on torture cases. And we had a case which turned strategical uh, in Kazakhstan and uh, a lawyer, a pro bono lawyer from New York, offered his assistance to the New York office. Uh, and he was willing to work on any case. He was suggested Kazakhstan. It was Gerasimov versus Kazakhstan. And it served such a great example to our legal community, even though that case didn't breed any positive results. The victim didn't, he was compensated, but not the amount that he, he had asked for. But that case was strategical in the other sense. We keep referring to the way that uh, American lawyer showed us how he was working, how he was working with the victim of torture. And we keep referring to that case and that quality of work to our um, legal professionals. And as recently as last week, for instance, when I was uh, a trainer at a training for judges in Kazakhstan, I was again referring to that case. And that case is back from 2009. Uh, so that lawyer, Joe Sir, from Lovells, uh, law firm, global law firm from New York himself. He came to Kazakhstan. He was um, assigned one case in Kazakhstan and several cases in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, he was taken to a small town in a very cold town. It was in winter uh, in Kazakhstan and shown to the victim. I, I, I wasn't accompanying him then. It was someone else. And he was videotaping the way he was working with that victim of torture. He first asked that victim of torture to tell him what had happened. And Alexander told him. 
So they were videotaping, um, and they were taking breaks. It was taking quite a long time. And after that, uh, Joe asked Alexander uh, the question. He said, I'm going to repeat what you have just told me, and you will correct me, please correct me, whenever I am wrong. So he repeated his story. And then there was the third stage, where he, had asked, where he asked Alexander to show on the people who were there in the room what had happened physically. So, and that videotape we used as evidence when we submitted the case to the UN Committee Against Torture. And it was the first case submitted against Kazakhstan uh, to the Committee Against Torture, after Kazakhstan had ratified the OPCAT, or not the OPCAT um, 21st article. Um, and it was that case that was um, adjudicated against Kazakhstan. Yes, sorry. <laughs> Kazakhstan was fo found guilty. And uh, uh, when we got the case back, it was the first and remains the only case in Kazakhstan implemented so far where the victim had been compensated more or less decently. And there was another case uh, in Kyrgyzstan where Joe also was working, uh, which Joe was also working on. And uh, uh, that case turned out to be um, precedental in, uh, um, in the whole hum uh, UN Human Rights Committee jurisdiction. Um, jurisd jurisprudence, thank you. <laughs> in that case, the victim who had been tortured in a police station returned safely home uh, the way he could but died there a few hours later or a day later. And it was the first time that the UN Human Rights Committee said that we see the link between the person's death and his treatment in or his time, the time he had spent at the police station. Uh, although the police and the state were saying that and arguing that there was no link. So that case turned out to be strategical. So we see how that person who is an American lawyer, who had, who had to do or wanted to do his pro bono work, how he used his experience in Kazakhstan. And uh, if you ask me if uh, pro bono really, if it sparked any pro bono in Kazakhstan, well, no, but we hope it will. Uh, and they have more questions, I think, than, than answers to our colleagues here. For instance, do, because it was referred here several times that only big law firms usually can afford or want to do pro bono cases. Do you need to be rich to do pro bono? Is there any room for the state in pro bono work? Or should there be a room for the state? Should state care at all about pro bono work? Because you see in Kazakhstan we have, uh, should, should the client or, or the beneficiary care uh, about what motivates uh, people who do pro bono work? Should he care? Does, uh, should the vi victim or client care? Was there commercial interest, was there ethical interest or religious interest behind someone's work done pro bono? So I, I have all these um, questions and would be happy to hear your answers. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tak Kan. I'm from Tongcheon Foundation in Korea. Uh, so Tongcheon Foundation is a public interest law foundation founded by a law firm called PKL in Korea and we focused on seven areas of minorities, including refugees, migrants, North Koreans, gender, teenagers, social enterprises, and welfare. So we do our own pro bono work, and we also act as a coordinator for the law firm PKL. Uh, so the session is called Mini Spark, as in uh, spark of fire within your soul. And I thought that was a bit ambitious because my goal in giving lectures or giving presentations is not to have anyone fall asleep during my talk, but um, I'll do my best. So a brief background on uh, law firm pro bono and public interest lawyering in Korea. Traditionally, we had human rights lawyers defending and representing a uh, human rights movement starting from 60s to 80s. And with the advent of democracy in 1990s, um, the term public interest law was first vocalized in mid-1990s and really really entered into public discourse with the establishment and the activities of Gongam, which was founded in 2004. And through Gongam's activities and um, advocacy, the public interest law um, in public discourse was defined as something 
that is focused on democracy, access to justice, and uh, human rights of social minorities. And with the success of Gongam, other uh, public interest lawyer groups were established following Gongam's example. And law firm pro bono is a much more recent phenomenon. Uh, Dongcheon Foundation, which is where I work, was founded in 2009 and really was the first attempt by major law firms to uh, systematically conduct its pro bono work by hiring a full-time uh, pro bono attorney. And with the success of Dongcheon, other major law firms have followed suit with most of the major law firms either hiring or trying to hire uh, full-time pro bono attorneys and having some sort of internal or external um, organization devoted to pro bono, uh, coordinating pro bono activities within the law firm. Um, so Korea today. Well, Korea, we believe, is still a vibrant democracy as evidenced by the protests last year uh, demanding the impeachment of the president at the time. And well, the protests continue for month or so and uh, had a million protests out on the streets on uh, any given day and which did succeed in impeaching the president at the time and electing a new president with a more liberal stance and who was um, incidentally human rights lawyer back in his days. But with this democracy, um, we have a widening gap of wealth and there is this intense competition to stay in the mainstream, stay on the wagon uh, within the society as evidenced by the, uh, I, I think, the highest rate of, high suicide rate among the developed countries. And with this intense competition to uh, stay in the mainstream of the society, we are seeing some instances of intolerance towards social minorities. And that's where I believe public interest lawyering and law firm pro bono can play a role in the Korean society. Uh, I'm stating the obvious here, obvious here, but the quite extensive state subsidized legal aid in Korea has been inadequate and probably will be inadequate to um, protect and advance the human rights agenda of social minorities, while on the other hand, public interest lawyer has been influential in advancing progressive agendas of human rights of social minorities. And I expect and hope that law firm pro bono will walk down the similar path in um, defending the human rights of social minorities. Uh, challenges and opportunities. And I have one minute left. And this is my final slide. Um, so this is both a challenge and an opportunity, but we, with the cha recent change in legal education system in Korea, we have seen the number of young lawyers increasing steeply and the number of lawyers has doubled in the past few years. And this is both a challenge in the sense that, well, obviously the competition within the law firm and among the law firm has been intensified. And more and more we are seeing young lawyers who say that we simply do not have the time or resources to you know, partake in pro bono activities. But it's also an opportunity in the sense that, well, with the number of young lawyers entering the market, we see many lawyers who have been interested in public interest law before starting their education and who are still interested in public interest lawyering. And um, the num among the public interest lawyers in Korea, I believe more than half of them are uh, within their five years of obtaining their license. And in terms of law firm pro bono, uh, especially focusing on major law firms, the 12 major law firms have um, established a law firm public interest network last year. And in this context, we are seeing some positive movements. Um, for example, there is some, we are retaining some peer pressure within the members of the network with, the, with one member um, trying to do better or trying to do something similar to each competitor within the network. And, uh, and that is a positive development. And finally, I'd like to mention new developments in the past year, which is the establishment of clearing houses. Uh, for example, Seoul Bar Association, which is the uh, largest regional association in Korea, has established its own clearing house uh, devoted to pro bono activities 
of its members and Dongcheon Foundation has been trying something similar. Um, we provide training to young lawyers who want to do pro bono activities and we match them one-on-one -on -one to uh, non-profit organizations who are interested in acquiring services, uh, uh, pro bono services of young attorneys and, I'm sorry, uh, services of attorneys and uh, the training is going pretty well, which is a testament to the number of young lawyers uh, interested in pro bono work. For example, um, the, in the last training, which, t which continued for four weeks, we, uh, the registration was over by, I don't know, one hour with more than 100 attorneys applying for this training. And most of them were young attorneys who did not have opportunity for pro bono activists and was eager to partake in the training. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Tagon. Um, uh, Yvette, Mexico. Thank you. I, I'm going to stand up because I can see the slides. Well, I, I'm going to try to save two minutes, so hope that in five minutes I will finish. Well, Centro Mexicano Pro Bono was established two years ago. Um, there is three clinic houses in Mexico. The pro bono movement start in, in Latin America in 2000, 2001. And uh, Centro Mexicano Pro Bono uh, was established in order to add and to, to be another uh, pro bono actor to help uh, to coordinate the pro bono work in Mexico. That is um, uh, something that we need, please. Uh, before to, to uh, uh, um, uh, tell you about a case of um, a study that I'm going to present, I, I just want to tell you uh, about us. Well, um, the beneficiaries of Centro Mexicano Pro Bono is vulnerable groups, nonprofits, and social entrepreneurs. And uh, the nonprofits, uh, we help them because we help to uh, help the people so they, they can continue uh, helping. There is so a specific law, uh, laws for nonprofits that the, the, these NGOs doesn't know very well, so we help them with all their obligations. And the social entrepreneurs, we think that if we help them in, in, the, in, in the part of um, um, entrepreneur in the first steps to uh, incorporate as uh, uh, companies, uh, we can help them to, to do it in the right way and to be um, uh, in the, um, how, how can we say, uh, <laughs> under, well, under the law. Uh, we have key partners. We have uh, 13 law firms. Of course, we, have, we work with the major law firms um, in Mexico, and some of them are international, as, um, international ones like um, Hogan Lovells, Baker McKenzie, uh, White and Case, and other uh, ones. Uh, also lo uh, um, local firms. And we have uh, also working with these other two clean houses, Appleseed and the Clean House of uh, the Bar Association. And well, we, we work a lot with nonprofits and government. And this is my team. This is uh, the internal, uh, well, there are uh, students and they are doing the social service in Centro Mexicano Pro Bono. Next, please. Well, um, this is how the demand of pro bono work we do. Most of them is in nonprofits. We help also the entrepreneurs and individuals. And why we don't uh, help more individuals? Because the pro bono lawyers that are working in Mexico are uh, from these uh, top law firms, and they are uh, specialized in um, incorporate law. So we don't have many civil law, family law, and human rights specialized in Mexico to help us with individuals. Um, well, this is uh, after two years, we have um, received and helped uh, 105 individuals, 60 nonprofits. We have given eight legal trainings, and uh, well, this is about the hours of pro bono we have done. Next. And something that I want to tell you is that with this disaster that we have in Mexico, the earthquake in the last past uh, weeks, we have a very uh, encouraging um, a challenge to help. All the society in Mexico were helping uh, from his side what, what he couldn't. We have seen um, doctors, psychiatrists, and lawyers helping in this disaster. Next, please. So we, um, 
We, as a Centro Mexicano Pro Bono, since the empathy, this, this were our office, by the way, <laughs> this, uh, this second floor were our office, we lost everything there. So we start to think in the same day with the other clean house, what can we do? Because if uh, we have 300 um, uh, lost humans, and, uh, but many, many people lost or their property or their patrimony in the city. So we start at the same day looking what we can do. Next, please. So what we did is uh, we approached to the other cleaning houses just to, the, the, to, to bring the, the effort uh, strength. So we started with a platform in internet, receiving all the uh, cases, all the legal questions that the people had. And um, we also uh, work with the law firms uh, saying, well, we are going to receive these cases. So we is willing to, to receive the calls and to give this legal advice to them. And also we decide to um, uh, develop a legal guide for the earthquake victims, since the people that uh, lost their beloved or their patrimony, their houses. And also we um, uh, did some legal brigades so we went, the lawyers with uh, so many law firms, we went to the, uh, thank you, to the places where the people were standing, seeing are they building the houses, if they are going to fall, because uh, it, it was amazing. After two, three years, the buildings started to fall down. So the people were like outside saying, well, my building is going to fall or not. The authorities, they didn't. Uh, wanted to let them in because of security reasons. And also we did some PR and media to promote uh, the work to arrive to the people that need it so they can call us. Please, next. So this is some of the photos uh, giving um, some uh, legal advice in the, in the areas uh, where they need it. Please, next. Uh, this is the legal assistance platform. So we did in... Uh, 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 social media, uh, all the information, and we put to uh, all the people this illegal um, uh, platform, and we received like about 5,000 uh, calls and requests for legal advice. Next. And this legal guide for the earthquake that even the government were using to help the people because it was very well done by the, by the law firm. Next, please. And uh, we disseminate the force in order to arrive um, to all the people. Here you can see the other uh, directors from the other cleaning houses because we did this effort um, in conjunction. And next, well, what it is the um, uh, our challenge? As I said before, we need to engage more uh, civil uh, law professionals and human rights. I increase the pro bono network because we are focused in big cities and we, have to, we want to arrive to a small towns and other cities and other states in Mexico. So that's it. Thank, Thank you. you. And uh, finally, Flavia and Bianca, Brazil. And as well. So good afternoon. I believe you are bringing a quite different perspective because we talk from a top local law firm, which is Matos Filho in Brazil, and we we are able to talk about pro bono in the region and, and, and the development of public interest law because Matos Filho started pro bono even before there was a clearinghouse or a debate about pro bono in the country. And I am nowadays the only pr full pro bono coordinator in, in the whole country as well. So just to explain to you where do we speak from. So I think it's very important before talking about the development of pro bono in the region to understand something which I believe is very common to other countries here, which is a contest of deep in a social inequality. So we cannot think of access to justice without having that uh, background context in mind. Uh, and just uh, here are just some of the ideas we we're going to try to do in seven minutes. Flavia, do you want to 
to say. Um, so some introductory reflections of talking about access to justice in Brazil, the Brazilian judici judicial system, and then a little bit of pro bono and what we have been doing. So, uh, uh, yeah, maybe, and I'll give you this. Yeah, here. So this um, is from a publication, this phrase from a publication that, and I believe it's common to all Latin America, that although the region, and I believe you, know, you agree with me, and I'm happy to say Lee had something, has something similar in Korea, although we have an, a, a development of our constitutional rights and our, of our democracy, effectiveness is just another thing. So uh, we had, and yesterday we, we spoke a lot about law written and law into force and effective, and I believe Latin America and, and also other countries present here also suffer from the same. Uh, the reality shows, although we have very advanced constitutions, it shows a lack on the access to real rights, not human rights, but rights in general. This is a photo I always uh, like to show uh, and I believe it explains Brazil very well. And these are like neighboring like <laughs> communities, if you can call the right one a community. But this is what happens in, in Brazil, and it, it got better in the last 10 years, but not essentially to a, a transformation. So, and this can explain a lot what access to justice is means as well. So a law firm like Matus Filho, and the fact that the country has 835 lawyers, this is data from 2014, so we have a proportion of one lawyer to every 200, 245 people in Brazil, which doesn't mean those people, though the majority of the population has, have any access to justice. And although our constitution, however, our constitution recognizes the access to just the free access to justice as a right, and is you know public policies have been uh, um, fighting to establish some institutions dedicated to it, but once again with lack of structure, with lack of resources, and effectiveness. So here just some informations of of, of our judicial system, and I believe this is a very diverse room. It's not the case of explaining how do we work there. But important to know how a common citizen can have access to free legal services according to our constitution. Uh, the appointment of a public defender, free legal assistance asked to a judge if the person says that uh, um, affirms not to have the financial resources to do it. Operation of legal clinics, and we have just a feel, I, I believe we won't have more than 10 legal clinics in Brazil, despite the huge uh, the, the size of, of the country, and the rendering of pro bono legal pr uh, uh, services, which is very recent, understood like, you know, pro bono as we have the, the model of the American uh, uh, firms, uh, and this is from 2001 as well in Brazil, although we have started at the firm, I wasn't there at the time, I was still studying to go to university, but Matsufila started in 1999. Um, as well as in Italy, Giovanni, uh, Brazil also, for uh, a person to go to a public defender, it has to prove not to earn more than $300 a month, which is, which is the minimum wage equivalent. Now this currency must have changed a bit because of the crisis, but something around that. And as I said, federal uh, legal assistance and legal clinics also guaranteed, but uh, uh, not effective and not spread out throughout the country. And so just a brief introduction, and I believe Flavia now can talk about the development of pro bono because she was the lawyer, like Giovanni is now in Italy. She was the one in Brazil 10 years ago, putting a whole pro bono community, and that's why we are here <laughs> together. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Pionat, for the invitation to be here. And... Uh, as if as mentioned, everything started in Latin America in about 2000. And, uh, uh, and we, we shared our presentation because I, I represent the history of pro bono in Brazil. 
I started everything in 2000, and Bianca now is uh, the head of Pro Bono in Matus Filho. And I'm, I'm also the chair of the Pro Bono Institute Brazil. Instituto Pro Bono is the only clear clearing house uh, in Brazil. And the important is to mention that our bar association, uh, OAB, uh, first issued the, the resolution of Pro Bono in 2002. And this resolution was very restricted and we could only uh, render Pro Bono services for NGOs. And the situations uh, going on until 2015 when everything has changed, when our Federal Bar Association decides to amend of Code of Ethics to implement any specific ruling for pro bono in Brazil. Uh, here. Uh, allowing lawyers to do pro bono for individuals and for not for profit organizations. And it was a revolution two years ago, and it made our firm to understand that we could also restructure our pro bono program. That's why we decided to bring Bianca, the only pro bono coordinator in Brazil, to develop a new program to start working with individuals. So we, we have now these main guidelines for pro bono, but the main issue is now the promotion and the defense of human rights. We, we decided to start working for individuals and to implement it inside the firm. So now we work with refugees, human rights, and LGBT rights. And this experience has been for us incredible. And now most of our associates in the firm do pro bono that 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 what that ha sorry doesn't wasn't oh my god sorry uh, this uh, didn't happen some years ago because just a few of our associates uh, did pro bono because they were not interested they are not connected with the NGOs uh, legal issues and now most of our associates do pro bono because they want to work with refugees they want to work with women's rights and LGBT people. So uh, the, the reflections is, we have uh, new opportunities to develop pro bono work in Brazil. And as I saw, uh, this also happens in Italy, Korea. So when you have uh, a regulations that uh, promotes pro bono, law firms like us, are able to do pro bono as well and change, maybe try to change the reality of our own country. And uh, maybe in uh, some years, we can change this reality in Brazil. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much, everyone. Um, well, the, the lunch officially started like seven minutes ago. Uh, but if you guys feel like maybe we can stay for another five minutes to see if people have like burning questions or comments. But also I'd like to mention that after lunch we'll have something called Global Pro Bono Cafe where I understand most of you will be uh, available to talk about the particular places or countries uh, or regions. Uh, but if people you know, want to ask a question or two now, please. I'll ask people keep keep people from their lunch at my risk. Um, I'm Eamon Conlon from um, Ireland. Um, it was interesting to hear about the role of the Bar Association in Brazil. And I was wondering in the other um, countries that are being spoken about, whether either local or national bar associations have been um, a hindrance or a help or just uninterested in pr developing pro bono culture. Perhaps I, I can start by saying that, first of all, I, um, some of them looked at me and still look uh, uh, stuck in the, in the medieval times <laughs> sometimes. <laughs> I'm sorry to say that, but it's true. Uh, secondly, um, there is a concern about uh, fees 
because they, they also have a, the, the, you know, the obligation to look after that. So anything which is related to pro bono sounds you know, a bit challenging in this sense. Thirdly, and not lastly, uh, we have an increasing phenomenon of poverty among lawyers, which means also that you know, a lawyer who cannot you know, go ahead and try to, to make a living out of his job is not so willing to, to do pro bono. Uh, so those are the, the, the elements. And last but not least, um, through the, 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 this kind of initiative, I noticed that there are many lawyers, regardless of the um, economic crisis, uh, who uh, do um, what I call the Italian way to pro bono. So they provide uh, um, services for free to people in need, but they, ju they are just not organized as such. So there is no in in institutionalization. So the discussion and the dialogue with the, with the, with the bar, bar Council, the Law Society, what you call Law Society, is, uh, I think, crucial, at least in my country. Thanks. Anyone else? Others? Well, in Mexico, um, it's important to mention that uh, to be a lawyer, you, don't, you, you are not buying to be a barrister. So we have three different bar associations, a corporate one, uh, one that came from the Spain like 600 years ago, and the Mexican Bar Association, the most popular one. So they do afford some pro bono, but, it, but I mean just for their barristers. So if many lawyers don't want to be in a bar, as, as it happens in Mexico, so you, you, you cannot get uh, involved in pro bono. So that's why the cleaning houses, the uh, independent cleaning houses has an important role to promote pro bono and to bring uh, pro bono cases to those lawyers and law firms. We should say that Brazilian Bar Association is not that amazing in terms of accepting Pro bono. I'm <laughs> we had an advance, but still the mentality is in the sense that a, a pro bono is a way of, um, cap, um, of attracting clients in a not uh, fair way. And then, then we have like the, the director of Pro Bono Institute in Brazil, Marcos Fox, he says something really funny, saying there are poor people for everyone. Don't worry, like we can <laughs> work on that. And lawyers can offer, like, like the, they will never be the clients able to pay the fees of big law firms in Brazil. But still there is this mentality of, oh, no, maybe something related to the fees. And also to publicity. We cannot say every time we have to do a social report, Flavia and I are, oh, should we put the names of the clients or of the organizations we work with or not? Because the Committee of Ethics of the Bar Association might understand that it's a way of publicity we are doing through the pro bono work. So, still a long way to go, but at least the regulation is there. So, um, Korea. Well, the bar association in Korea is not that amazing to repeat the situation in Brazil, but in the Korean bar association's defense, uh, I should mention that Korean bar association actually petitioned the National Assembly for the amendment of the our Attorney Act to introduce the mandatory pro bono requirement of attorneys, even if for mundane reasons such as maintaining the uh, political power of bar associations. But um, recently, we've seen a series of uh, bar association presidents who have been conservative and not really sympathetic to public interest lawyer groups or the causes they represent. But even, for, even if for the reasons of maintaining the lobbying power of the bar associations or even for individual agendas, political agendas of the president's uh, Korea, bar association in Korea do maintain some form of pro bono uh, activities and organizations. Uh, in Kazakhstan, we are in process of institutionalizing pro bono. And the bar is strictly against it. Because um, they think that they work in the state-sponsored legal system, which is not pro bono. You get paid very little, but you do. And they don't, don't consider that uh, fair for them to provide something pro bono. And we, as human rights community, uh, we are facing this real problem. How to motivate people? We know that you can't 
impose pro bono, which the state is trying to do now in Kazakhstan. You can't, you can't impose it on lawyers. That should be voluntarily. Uh, but still, this number of people who are in need of free legal assistance is big. So we only can hope that lawyers and um, they, they might be willing to do something pro bono. Thank you. Um, I think we have to stop here. And um, I sincerely apologize for the mess in the beginning. Uh, and encourage you to continue to um, communicate with each other. And let's give the speakers a round of applause.